So I'm heading record. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to this week's PCDN Career Impact Chat. I'm Craig Zelzer from PCDN. We are delighted to have here joining us today, Bautista Lofico, who has had a almost 20 year career in all things peace building, development, dialogue. And I will just summarize his bio because if I read the entire bio, we'd be here for the whole session. But he has worked in Latin America, Africa, Asia, for the United Nations, many different parts. So he could write an interesting book or a series of blog posts about careers at different parts or branches of the UN, um, the OAS, the Organization for American States, for different entities in Argentina and elsewhere. He has training as a lawyer from the Univers National University of La Plata. And he also has a master's degree in international development policy from Duke in North Carolina. Um, he was also among the, or in the first class of Rotary Peace Fellows. And full disclaimer, Rotary is helping to sponsor our career impact series. And I'll put a link to the Rotary Fellowship. It is an amazing, I'm not just saying this because they helped sponsor it. It is a wonderful, incredible, amazing fellowship where you can do a master's degree at one of, I think, six universities or a three month certificate at one of two universities. The deadline's May 15th. So check it out. And if you can't apply this year, keep it in mind for future years or share in your network. Um, if you haven't joined in a PCN career chat before, the Bautista will talk anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And then we do 100% open conversation. So you can put your comments, questions in the chat box or also raise your hand using the Zoom thing, which if you're on a computer, you can click on your profile and then we'll call and you can turn your video and your microphone, we call on you. We do this every Thursday at noon. So next week, we're gonna have an amazing innovator, Prema Wadakir, who has been working in social impact in India and all over the world and private sector, um, including Schneider Electric. And she'll be with us next Thursday, the following week, we're gonna have another Rotary Peace Fellow from Zimbabwe, who's actually starting to work on Yemen. So talk about kind of different things and always feel free to be in touch with suggestions or questions. So Batista, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to also let us know how your week is going, and then I'll turn, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Craig, uh, PCDN, PCDN, for inviting me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, sharing this dialogue space, right, with, uh, with you and with everyone. Uh, and the, I think the idea is that this is a dialogue. So please feel free, everyone, to just, you know, come in with questions, comments, reflections, whatever it is that um, this exchange triggers. I will be, just a disclaimer first, I will be looking here, but also a bit here because I have my computer here and so I can see all your faces here. Um, my week has been pretty busy. Uh, and since I'm working with a team that is based in Rome uh, I, uh, and, and other parts of the world as well, but uh, I, uh, I have like very early starting hours. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been very great in that I think a few um, initiatives, both within uh, you know my job uh, and then within the volunteer initiatives that I'm engaged with, have moved forward. So I'm happy that that, that it goes like that. Um, so yeah, we can say it's been a, a good week. I mean, considering the circumstances with the pandemic and the situation here in Argentina, where I'm, where I'm based at the moment. So if you want, I, I'll just go into a little bit of what I had thought of uh, for, for today to share with you. And what I thought would be an interesting journey uh, for today's conversation, and also an interesting approach um, is, um, you know, this, you know how, how we, uh, we had in the title this trying to leave or, or to explore, to push beyond our comfort zones. Um, and, uh, so a little bit of the journey that I wanted to share with you today was, uh, you know, like my career, what is it that I have been doing, uh, wh where I started, where I am right now, uh, in terms of the peace building, conflict transformation um, side of it. Um, but also uh, share with you a little bit of like some decisions that i made here and there uh, when I was becoming, um, too comfortable, but not because I was becoming too comfortable, just because uh, I think life also makes us um, question ourselves and our choices at different stages, at some stages more than others. And I think we really need to be open to having the, 
dialogue with ourselves as well and, and ask those questions. Uh, and then maybe sharing with you a few um, lessons that helped me. So maybe they can also help you or, or you may have others that can help me and others. So please share them as well in terms of how um, I moved forward in this career. And <clears throat> this is, I, I would say this is not a model, it's an example. So there could be many examples of how we build uh, our careers and most importantly have a, uh, a good, healthy um, life balance, particularly when we're dealing with issues like um, conflict transformation and peace building, where we uh, oftentimes we are in the face of very difficult circumstances of, of a lot of uh, suffering, um, a lot of um, um, horrible things that we see, try to analyze, understand, uh, et cetera. And, and how important it is to also uh, give ourselves the chance to, um, uh, to balance all of that with the good things that that career has, because it has a lot of rewards, uh, but also with our personal lives, which sometimes we, uh, we put aside for the sake of the career. Uh, and I think it reaches a point where that takes uh, a toll if we're not mindful. Uh, so, okay, great. So, as, uh, and one thing that I noticed is that from all your presentations is that uh, there is at least one thing in common uh, that I have with each of you. Uh, it's really interesting how connected we, can, we are or we can be. It's either the place where you're based or the issues that you're working on or the issues that you're studying. And uh, I really want to like stress the power of networks uh, such as this one, helping us find those connections on this, you know, maybe uh, more superficial issues if you want, but then how that can help start opening up relations uh, and strengthening our networks. Uh, and that is something key that I will speak of. Okay, so my journey. Um, today, I'm a senior peace and conflict advisor with the World Food Program, um, uh, with, with, with which I started working in November last year. Fascinating um, experience with a fantastic team um, working on issues, uh, on some issues that were very familiar to me, and then on some issues that are very new to me, like you know, trying to understand better the existing evidence uh, uh, and working on creating evidence on the links between food security, food insecurity, uh, and, and other uh, related topics with conflict, with peace, uh, uh, you know, trying to identify explicit uh, peace outcomes uh, uh, when we're um, discussing or designing food programming, uh, food security programming. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that, you know, it, 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 that is where I am right now. I started uh, many, many years ago. Well, I mean, in terms of like the professional path, let's put it that way. As Craig said, I, I, I'm a lawyer by practice. I, I studied law and, um, and I did practice a little bit when I was here. Uh, I used to, to say that it's weird because uh, as a lawyer, I was trained to create conflict <laughs> quite a lot, uh, at least in my university. Like they would train you to go straight to litigation, right? Which is something that has changed, fortunately. Uh, and then I ended up in this <clears throat> more conflict transformation dialogue, peace building path. Um, and then uh, as a, uh, in, my, in my student, I'm in my career, I started to uh, find or to learn a bit more about um, negotiation. Mostly it was through negotiation uh, at the time that I got into alternative ways of solving conflict that were not like the legal ones. Uh, and then at the same time, I started like um, really focusing my research and interest in international humanitarian law, the, the law of armed conflict and international human rights law back in the day. And all that positioned me quite well to apply for the Rotary World Peace Fellowship Scholarship at the time, now Rotary, well, not Rotary Peace Fellowship. Um, and I encourage everyone to look at the program because it's a fantastic program as Craig and Caroline was, were just 
uh, sharing. And I was, you know, member of class one of that scholarship. And it allowed me to attend a master's program at Duke University that was focusing on international development policy, but with a focus on peace and conflict resolution. This was 2002, 2004. Uh, and that's the link, uh, Kirk has just shared the link of the Rotary Peace Fellowship. <clears throat> And, and the time when it started, both the fellowship, but also the program at Duke, I mean, the program at Duke, the Masters in International Development Policy, well, you know, came from way back, but it was in 2002 uh, that it started to uh, get adjusted and focus one, like, like a part of it to really address uh, conflict prevention uh, and peace building from a development lens. This is really important because it was like at the, in, the early, in the early 2000s uh, that we were starting to see conflict prevention coming up <clears throat> uh, more frequently as part of the, let's say, conflict resolution agenda, if we want. And we were starting to see how different actors at the international level were starting to integrate conflict prevention as part of their work. Uh, it was in the early 2000s that, for instance, the United Nations Development Program set up uh, a bureau called BCPR, Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery, in which I had the uh, pleasure of working with a, also an amazing uh, team of uh, uh, colleagues uh, uh, after uh, after my master's. But it, it was really interesting to, to see, and this is something also to keep in mind, um, to be open, like in a career such as, you know, a career in peace building, conflict transformation, to be open and try to be uh, updated as much as possible in what's coming up uh, in the field. What are, what are the trends? Where are the, where's the attention going? Where, where, where are the resources going? Because that will give us an idea of what can come up next for us, right? <clears throat> so uh, then I finished my master's at Duke. Something really interesting that happened, if any of you are in your master's stage, is that, uh, uh, in the master's or university stage of your careers, something really interesting. I had the chance to work with UNDP, BCPR, in, in a master's project that try to look at how to integrate conflict prevention uh, into UNDP's policies and programs. So this was quite innovative back in the day. Uh, and then UNDP ended up doing something along those lines. But you know how you can also start from early stages in your career to work with clients. Uh, it could be an NGO, it could be uh, someone on the government side, it could be an intergovernmental organization uh, who with, to, or to whom you can, provide something useful and of value even at early stages of your career because you might have the time and resources to think something and sit down and reflect uh, and this is time that sometimes when you are like in the midst of like running around with operations and, and projects and stuff then you might not have so keep that in mind and then from that I jumped um, to the uh, my first let's say uh, formal job in this career internationally was with the Organization of American States. Uh, so I was based in DC and I worked with the OAS for five years on conflict prevention, conflict transformation, peace building. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, well, I mean, we can go into more detail into that journey. It was a fantastic experience as well. Uh, and uh, and it, it's really, I found it really interesting to start with a small organization like the, o I mean, small compared to the UN, right? Uh, Intergovernmental organization in that um, usually in smaller organizations, you have more responsibilities uh, and, 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 and more exposure and, and, uh, and the sort at early, earlier stages in your career. Right, so I remember with the OAS, probably I was doing uh, like I had a certain level, but I was doing the job that people of like one or two levels above that level were doing at the UN, just because there was, uh, the, the, you know, the, we needed to maximize all those uh, resources. Um, at the OAS, I had a chance to well, I, I spent most of my time in the region. 
uh, not in 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 headquarters, but uh, for half of my time there, I spent most of my time in in Colombia, actually working in the demobilization of the um, autodefensas uh, of the paramilitary, uh, and I also worked in the good offices between Colombia and Ecuador when they broke uh, diplomatic relations as part of the OAS good offices mission between Colombia and Ecuador. I. Um, I worked uh, as part of a team led by a former Argentinian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs that uh, facilitated a crisis in Nicaragua in 2005, uh, and so on and so forth in, in, in many interesting complex contexts in the region. Um, and, and, and it was a fantastic, for me, it was a great uh, learning curve, right, because I was still in my in my late 20s and I was starting to um, have like first-hand knowledge uh, and experience in these very interesting processes and then uh, one day I was kind of like testing how I was doing you know I just I was like okay let's see how am I doing uh, you know with, if I wanted to apply for something at the UN uh, I was with a very good position at the OAS I was I was with uh, I had a good contract right so there wasn't really any strong reason for me to move to the UN in my view at the time and this was just personal and at the time we can see then afterwards if that's the same but I saw the UN as like you know like okay this is the next step in my career to move the o from the OAS to the UN that doesn't necessarily have to be the case but I saw it like that and I remember having a conversation with someone at the organization uh, then who said, uh, who told me, oh, yes, I also wanted to do that when I was in your place. Uh, uh, but then, you know, um, the pension fund and then you have a life here and then it's so and I remember, you know, I remember me saying, OK, you know, to myself, but I'm not sure that is the path that I want for myself. Um, if you know, I understand that for some people, particularly with families, you know, they, the, the, all the, the, the financial security can be a, a key and priority aspect, which is totally understandable. And I, I would have probably uh, thought about that too if I had had a family uh, back up then. But I, I had the liberty and the freedom to try something else. So eventually, um, I moved from like this, like good position, um, you know, like security ish uh, post with the OAS to a temporary post with the UN. And at the time it was with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations as political affairs officer. So uh, it wasn't a huge step um, forward in terms of uh, you know responsibilities and stuff, but it, was, it allowed me to make that move from one system to the other. That was what I was looking for at the time. And it was really interesting because when I was there, uh, I, I went in to replace someone who was on special leave without pay, um, who uh, at the time, I, uh, I, from the info I had, he was not really sure about coming ba uh, back because he had like his own stuff outside or he wanted to try something. But then it was, 2000, uh, it was, it was 2009, right after the 2008 crisis in the world. So I get a phone call from him like at some point after three months, I had quit my job and, you know, I had this temporary contract very short and it's like, well, you know what, um, I'm sorry, but I have to go back. You really need to start looking for something else because um, I need my job back. And he was right. And I was, oh, shoot, why did I quit like all this, you know, uh, um, certainty and security uh, for what? Um, and then eventually things worked out. And then I started working for BCPR, the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery, the, who with I had worked during my master's project. And then from there, I moved with, uh, to the UN Peace Building Fund, uh, which, is, uh, which was also a fantastic experience. And then it reached a point where I was like, I was entering my early 40s. And I was like, so what is it that you want to do? with your life um, uh, at the time. So I had spent uh, quite a lot of time in between uh, uh, the uh, headquarters and the field, but 
I was, my post was in headquarters. So, you know, having a career in peace building and conflict transformation was for me time to move somewhere else uh, to the field. But at the same time, I felt that my um, personal life was, had been put on, on hold for a range of reasons. And, you know, I was based in New York. I could have had a personal life, but somehow there was something saying, well, you need to be back home to feel what it is to be back home, close to your brothers and sister, close to, you know, like your roots and see that. Um, plus, at the, uh, I, I, I think, Craig, well, you knew and you, you asked me if you could mention it. And I said, yes, I'm, it's fully integrated. I'm also, I'm also an actor and I also have an acting career. And at the time I was like, okay, let's try this a little bit more. And then we can talk about how like different disciplines, passions that we have can coexist and feed each other, if you want. So it, I, I took a special leave without pay and uh, I eventually moved back to Argentina and um, I had to go back to my post in New York, but then I, I met someone. Uh, so the relationship eventually uh, showed up in my life. Um, and I was close to my family and stuff. And I'm like, okay, is it that I can stay here uh, and still work on these issues that really are my passion, uh, you know? And I managed to do so. So I presented my resignation, which for many people would have been a bit crazy because I, you know, I had like a post in New York, uh, you know, a good position uh, and working on fascinating issues. And, but then I became an independent consultant working with not just with the same people, same team I was working before, but as a consultant uh, for certain specific assignments, but also with other agencies within the UN system, particularly with UN women going into gender responsive conflict analysis and uh, programming on women, peace and security, going into um, 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 other type of programming linked to the role of women as peace builders in the Latin American region specifically, but also more globally. And then I also supported other UN agencies and other development banks. And I even set up my own little project, uh, which is a, a, a dialogue space. So we can reflect on how we can like dialogue more and better with those who we have close to us, family and friends in context of high polarization as we have in Argentina, but in other parts of the region as well, as we have in the US um, as well. So, and, and then eventually last year, um, this opportunity came up with the World Food Program and I found it fascinating um, uh, because uh, I think that as a result also of, uh, of the pandemic and what COVID, the COVID crisis has both deepened and, vis vis and helped visibilize in terms of like deep structural uh, root causes of tensions, uh, instability and, and inequality. Um, you know, food security camps as one of, uh, of the key uh, factors to, to keep in mind. So I was like, okay, this is great. I can bring in my peace building conflict transformation experience, but I will also learn from colleagues who have been working on food security for many years uh, and, and, and integrate this uh, in a good way. So that was a little bit of my journey. I see that there are questions coming up. Um, uh, maybe I'll take some and then I'll, I'll I'll go into other stuff. Yeah, Bautista, you don't have to worry about it because I worry about that and I usually okay. do a very bad job. <laughs> <laughs> no worry, it's, no worry. it's not my fault. It's just that Zoom, the way it's modeled. But the first question came uh, from Caroline and then the second question would be from Caroline and then uh, Craig and I, but please keep coming your questions. And then, by the way, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I, so for those of you that listen to the podcast that I you, do, I usually, not every person can do it, but I find it really fascinating when you can combine your journal with, with personal considerations. And I think you did a wonderful job, but uh, 
mapping your career, but also where you were personally at that point. Because I think that makes so much sense for us to, if you detach from the personal decisions, you don't quite understand a person's trajectory. So thank you for that. I have a million questions, but the first question is from Carolina Bautista. You mentioned that an early career intern slash volunteer can really add value with research or in-depth projects because they have time to think deeply. Do they have time to think deeply? Can you elaborate on the approach you'd suggest skill volunteers take to create these sorts of opportunities? And yes, it's a great question. Thank you, that is a, that is a great question. And, and I think it worked for me and I know it has also worked for other uh, people who I work with, like our, uh, at least this was a very, uh, and at Duke University and within the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, we also, um, uh, have that accompaniment if you want uh, and we, we still try to do so from now we have an association that brings together more than 1500 peace builders throughout the world who have gone through the broader peace program but so uh, this might be easier when you're attending programs that uh, where for your final um, piece of work you have to produce a master's project instead of like your typical research project but you can also do it with a research project so basically my advice would be to um first off see what what are the list of topics that you would be interested in addressing because there needs to be that drive right i, I remember there is this little book by aristotle um called um uh, poetics right where he analyzes uh, greek uh, drama and, and he talks about pathos, which is passion, which is something that drives you. It's, um, it's passive in ourselves. And then um, the uh, axis, which is uh, the uh, action, right? Uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, is that axis that he meant? And it's the action, which is what we do to pursue that action. So it's like the active part of, uh, of, of that. Uh, so first thing is to really go through what your path, and this applies for your entire career, to ask for ourselves what, what, where our passions lie in terms of topics and issues that we're interested in, in, in working on. Don't be afraid of having too many. Uh, don't be afraid if they change. It's really okay that the different things that, you know, makes you passionate about something change throughout time. And it's really also cool that we change, you know, views and opinions throughout our <laughs> history, because otherwise we would be in the same place we were when we were teenagers, for instance. And I certainly don't want to be there the way I used to think. Um, so um, find out what those topics are. Uh, find out who's working on those issues, which organizations, NGOs, uh, intergovernmental organizations, uh, think tanks, um, you name it. Look at the stakeholders who could be working on those issues. Um, use your networks to get in touch with those working in these issues that you, you prioritize. Uh, and um, you can work on a specific like project proposal, research project proposal, that will be of use to them. There is, you have to do your homework, which means finding these <clears throat> stakeholders who are working on the issues you're interested in and <clears throat> looking at what is it that they are doing right now. <clears throat> you know, it needs a little bit of research on your part uh, to understand what types of programs and uh, research they're undertaking. So then you can see where there could be a niche for what you want to bring forward. Or you can ask first for an informational interview saying, look, I'm really interested in the work that you're doing. I have been researching on this and that. And I think it could, if you're interested, I could produce some piece of research on these other issues that you're working on, but I would like to know where would be the best added value if you're interested. And then, you know, something really interesting can come up. <clears throat> Again, it did work <clears throat> for me as a, as a master's student working with a client and with someone within that client. <clears throat> Who was my focal point uh but yeah you have to do find first what you're interested in then who's doing working on that or related then connecting with them asking for an informational interview if any and then coming up with a proposal that would fit a niche that they might be interested in looking into deeper at, the, at this time and they can't because they they don't have necessarily the resources to do it at the moment 
<coughs> that would be uh, my advice on that. Thank you so much. And did you want, uh, oh, you have your water. Yeah, we, we're yeah. need your water because the questions <laughs> are coming in. And so all I'm going to do is um, get but, to our second Caroline. Is that OK? Good. Yes, okay. and then I can go a little bit to uh, because I want to go back to what you said, you know, this going back and forth with your personal life and what led me to pursue, like to leave my last like full-time position and pursue the career. Because I think there could be also some interesting things to, to share there. What, do you want to do it now or do you want to? <laughs> no, let's do, let's do the question and then we go back. Okay, okay. So from our second Caroline of, of today, uh, from all your experiences, which role do you feel you had the strongest leverage for impact? Um, so she poses examples, field versus headquarters, UN versus NGO. So from all my positions, um, that is a very good question. Um, so I did my homework to prepare for this and I, I tried to think of um, where my strengths lay at each. So your strengths also are gonna change at each stage of your career, right? Um, and uh, I have done this exercise now where I'm like at this specific stage in my career, right? Uh, but they might have been different at different points in time. Okay, so basically what worked for me, um, and I think here guys, there is something um, that I, I really wanna share because, uh, and, and this is very much linked with, with this other part of the personal life. If you ask me, what is it that I love about my career slash life at the moment is that I get to work in fascinating, really um, key issues, right? With people who are like, giving their best uh, on this. But I also have the chance to, um, I think, choose what I want to do um, and have that freedom. For me, that is priceless, like that MasterCard um, ad, right? Um, to have the freedom to choose what to do and what not to do and what to prioritize in your professional and personal life. I'm almost 45 years old. That is something that I think I had very clear from like at least since like since my 30s, let's say, that I wanted to reach a point where I could have that freedom. And here's where the personal also comes back. My mother, my mom passed away when she was 47 years old, and my father when he was 46. So my thinking. You know, those, of course, those like shocks uh, affect and have an impact in like all aspects of your life. So something that has like fed my decisions throughout my life has been the fact that like, for instance, today, if I pass away when my mom passed away, I have two more years to go. Do I really want to go through something that does not make me happy? The answer is very clear, <laughs> no. <laughs> so. Finding a format in my professional career that um, allows me to have certain degree of freedom. And again, this is my personal journey. Probably if I had kids, the equation would be different. And I would have other, um, and I would have other, um, you know, things to look into, but then my priority would be my family. And then probably my focus of my happiness would also be uh, spread out throughout uh, uh, a range of, uh, of, um, of actors and, uh, and stuff. So what worked for me uh, to create that leverage that Caroline was asking uh, just a bit ago? To me, something that really helped was to focus on developing, I mean, without knowing, and this is why the pathos, the passion part of it is that important, because without that, then it's really hard to sustain that through like so many years, right? So really listen to your gut, first of all, 
and by your gut, I mean your actual gut, not your brains, because we go through these socialization processes that we have to filter everything through the pros and cons of our brains, but our gut has already told us what it is. <laughs> Think of all the big decisions you've made and how like we, we're, we are trained since, like when we're kids, we let it flow much freely, but as we grow, like we tame it and socialize it. It, it needs to be this. Now go back to that. So I, I put it here because I feel I feel it here. Um, so something that helped was to uh, focus on like developing an expertise on uh, conflict prevention, conflict transformation, and and, and peace building, sustaining peace. Now that we're since 2015, we're, we're starting to talk about sustaining peace as a, a more comprehensive process, a pro, a, both a process and a goal in itself. Um, and so also in the last, let's say, 10 years of my life, I really focused a lot on, um, you know, strengthening my conflict analysis skills. Um, and then uh, my, conf my conflict prevention, conflict transformation, peace building programming skills. So on understanding what's going on and then on how can I use that better understanding to provide responses, both from a political standpoint, but mostly from a programmatic standpoint. So what are the type of interventions that can help address these conflict drivers and these conflict processes that I have, I have identified and transform systems, structures, and relationships? Um, so um, the interesting thing about that to create my leverage is that conflict transformation, peace building, sustaining peace, let's call it however we want to call it, um, it's a field that it's specific yet broad enough um, to allow us to dive into a whole set of new content every time. So I was coming from the from my experience with the you know with the peace building fund with where I was like looking at a lot of this, uh, and I was coming uh, before that with uh, with UNDP as well, and then. As an independent consulting a consultant, uh, for instance, I started one of the things started to do was to work closely with uh, UN women on really making this analysis gender responsive. So I was bringing in this, and I was learning from the teams, the new teams and colleagues I was working with, how to integrate. Uh, content views lenses that would make what I was bringing in much richer and actually much more effective at the end of the day to address um, uh, what we wanted to address. And then I think a similar thing happened with my, you know, passing to uh, WFP. So you keep bringing all your expertise, your technical knowledge, and uh, your journey with you but you're open and humble enough so as to let all these new content, you know, uh, come in and, you know, be part of that uh, new set of, um, uh, of skills that you have. I think what, there was someone, uh, I think, Gina, you said you worked on dialogue. Uh, I remember I also worked uh, advising uh, governments here in Argentina, local government, uh, state governments, on dialogue processes. And for me, it was fascinating, uh, for instance, working with uh, the, um, uh, how do you, in English, how do you say, uh, dispo uh, waste disposal um, waste, waste, waste entity. Man waste management. Waste management, waste management entity. And working uh, in the design of a dialogue process to pass on a law for that would you know that was for aimed at, at, at giving waste specific treatment. I knew nothing about waste management, but I knew about you know the design of dialogue processes. I knew about uh, uh, the facilitation of those processes, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, it was really fascinating to have this set of skills that then allowed me to like really like dive deep into this other. So the first thing is to create that leverage that would allow you to have that freedom um, is I think finding a, an area of expertise that is specific enough yet broad enough so as to allow you to transfer all these skills to different specialized fields. 
Then in my case, something that really was also useful was my knowledge, my detailed knowledge of the UN system as a whole. So this jumping at certain points in time from one place to another was useful in that it allowed me to get to know the organization in its in, in its complexity and and, and you know like um, comprehensiveness a bit better than maybe if I had stayed in one uh, specific agency uh, for the same time. And I think this is very much linked with you know, becoming a kind of a specialist in, in in a field because then you can. Again, you switch like the substance behind, but then the set of skills uh, and, and knowledge specific to peace building and conflict prevention transformation is, uh, it, you know, it can be adjusted, adjusted and adapted. A third thing that helped me with my leverage is the networks. Um, and, I, uh, and I always say two things. Keep your networks alive, keep them growing and keep them alive. Do check from time to time. I'd say three things. Then never, never, ever burn bridges. So never leave a place in a, in, 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 in a bad way. I mean, sometimes I understand it can be difficult to do so. Uh, but well, in my case, I've always managed to work with teams and supervisors, leaders who would like really respect and encourage uh, growth. So it, it, it was not hard on the country. Uh, it was very easy to leave those teams and leave them well. And then that allowed me to keep working with them even from outside those teams, um, which is very important. But also related to networks is uh, something, one thing is to keep the network alive. The other thing is to activate the network. So make sure that you'll activate the network when you're ready to take on your next um, adventure. Something that also worked for me uh, to create that leverage was the language or languages. So I speak English. I'm a Spanish native speaker. I speak English uh, and I speak French as well. Uh, and both the Spanish and the French uh, came, uh, came up very handy uh, for... Uh, for uh, you know, for, for for being like for people to keep you more in mind because they know that you can deploy to uh, different settings. Um, then I would also keep myself updated with the latest trends and knowledge and tools and methodologies and reforms, you know, from the UN system. So. I have a friend who's been directly involved now, now from a diplomatic mission to the UN on like this, the, the, the writing of this resolution that the Security Council passed. Hey, can we talk about this? Because uh, I really want to get like the insight. So, you know, I know where the thing is going or, you know, the, the, the UN reform is going on. Who do I know who really knows about that process and could, you know, shed some light into, the, the rationale where this is going, what might come up. Same thing with tools and methodologies, right? Um, and for that, you know, this specific network that we're all being part of at the moment is fantastic, but there are other networks as well. So just keep, you know, getting and, 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 and taking advantage of that and, and, and keep abreast of what's coming up. Uh, and then I would suggest if you have the time, when you can, because sometimes it's not possible to balance uh, what you do with a publication here and there, um, you know, uh, uh, an active engagement in different spaces, like this one, like other networks that you may have uh, or you may be part of. Um, you know, all, all of this really helps expand that network. So why I say this gave me a leverage, because I do think that today I have a network that I can rely on if, I want to explore different shores at some other point in my life in terms of my career. So I don't know, Caroline, if that answers, um, but um, it, it, it worked for me. And again, it's not that it has to work for everyone. I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna jump in here. Thank you so much, Bautista. The, the networking is so important and it's not transactional networking, but purpose-driven. Because if you network, if I contact Bautista and say, give me a job, that is not the way to network. It's like, oh, you're doing interesting stuff. Let's chat. And it, so there's a lot of transactional networking. Forget about it. It doesn't work that yes. way. 
Um, so so here's a, there's a question from Gina on networking. We have a lot of questions. So I just want to raise her question. Um, so it's often said that positions are filled, at least in DC, 80% are through networking. So Gina's question is like, how does networking work for landing positions in international organizations where usually the recruitment process is much more structured and formal? So like if you're applying for a consultant to your job at UN Women or FAO or UNDP, is it important to network or it's so it's a blind hiring process and networking is not important? I think, and, and I think you're touching a, this is a very good question. I think you're touching a point that um, also is, is critical. And, um, and, you know, and we, we go back to this network um, thing. For, for us Latins, um, I, I think things might have changed a bit, but I remember when I first came out of Duke University in 2004, I found it really hard to network because I thought, you know, like it, for the culture I was coming from, it was really, ah, you know, like you have to go sell yourself. Well, it, it is a mix of selling, but it's not just selling. And it's not, you know, because in some contexts, you do have people who are appointed to posts, like in my home country, for instance, because they know someone or, you know, and, and that is not what networking is. Networking doesn't mean that someone will give you a job because you know them. Networking means that uh, you will create these um, relations based on common interests, right? That would allow your network to know what you have done, what you could bring in potentially to address that issue, and eventually when you're up to look for other opportunities that you're open to explore opportunities, but also that you are there to be part of the receiving end of that network when others also, you know, uh, want to engage. So it's, it's really, uh, and for me, there is a lot of, and again, it's not that everyone has to, see it like that but for me there is a lot of gratitude because a lot of people were there advising me and you know helping me and facilitating spaces for me when they didn't know me and it was because of the networks I belonged to that you know that happened in fact my first job with the OAS was thanks to a network with an alum that started with someone at Duke University putting me in touch with a Duke alum who was working at the OAS. And uh, I remember I sent him a first email and he never responded. And I'm like, oh, you know, he didn't respond to that. And it was because he was a mission. It wasn't, you know, like, and I can see, he, that it can feel for him now because like, uh, it happens to me the same, you know, like some, if you email me on a day that I'm like crazy, I probably won't see it. Or like, I try to leave it, you know, like unread and da, 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 but. And then he met with me and he introduced me to the woman who ended up giving me my first opportunity, which was a three month contract uh, at the time to whom I'm extremely grateful. And then I kept on working with her uh, at the OES. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to so, jump, uh, jump in because we want to make sure we have a, a bunch more questions that came in. So sorry, sorry. But, um, yes. so we have one, I'm going to raise two questions that came up once from Isabella, which you've talked a lot about. So. And I, I've had the same thing I've written on it, but um, how do you know when it's the right time to take that risk of leaving stability and what people or society expects you to do to jump into something completely risky? And then a similar question from Jessica. She's really fascinated by your career. She's a filmmaker, was a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and she's curious, how do you balance your acting career and your peace building career? And what do you see as the opportunities for putting the two together? So like, is your acting career connected to your peace building career or is it like two separate? <laughs> two great questions. So the first one on when, when you know it's the right time. I have two questions, two, uh, two reflections. The first one, your gut knows it. Even, even when your brain doesn't want to validate it, your gut knows it. Yeah, and I keep this, and, and this is very much linked to my work uh, as an artist and, you know, like trying to go back to, um, to that connection with myself and my 
body and 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 you know in Spanish um, we say uh, uh, what we have learned from indigenous communities is that you know they they really uh, pay attention to saberes like to knowledge and and, and sentires and to like the, the, the way we feel uh, so like to really acting really helped me with that so one your God will tell you but two so a little bit to balance that I would I, I'm all, I also want to be very clear that every step that I had taken uh, had a plan with it. So it's not that I jumped, you know, uh, you know, it's not that I jumped to like just uh, without a, a safety net. Uh, I mean, yes, of course, the safety net varies, right? Um, in the sense that when I moved to from the OAS to the UN, I moved to a temporary contract, but at least I had 11 months of a contract. Right to see what would come up, uh, and uh, so I would say mix listening to yourself to know when to take that step, but also plan for it. So, um, for instance, uh, when I took the decision to resign to the UN, I already knew that the and this also uh, because of the different positions uh, or to resign to that post that I had, uh, I had been in positions where I had to bring in people, hire consultants with a profile similar to mine. So I knew that what I had to offer was something that many people in the system might uh, find useful as a consultant. So I did it also with that, with, with the, the homework having been done on the, on the network side. So look, I'm leaving, but I will be available uh, to do all this work that you're doing here, there and everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, and yeah, so gut, but also plan for it, and ensure that um, that you can mitigate the risk uh, as much as what it is within the realm of that the control and that mitigation from your own side. And then on balancing both um, dimensions, let's put it that way. It has worked, and and uh, the independence uh, or the that you have being an independent consultant helps uh, to balance it. Um, when you have a you know like a more of an office uh, type of uh, structure, it can limit it a little bit more. But you can always make them work. Um, now the pandemic has stopped a little bit uh, here in Argentina, um, quite a bit of that of that work. Um, in my case, I did took a full year to just dive fully into acting. I was based in Bogota, actually. I had a, my manager in Bogota is a fantastic manager. Uh, and I did some really cool things, you know, like for TV. And then I did a play that year in Spain uh, for the summer. And it was fantastic. And I also realized that I was missing this other part of myself. Uh, so finding that balance was also was also a, a quest in itself, uh, and I think you can totally do it. And I think that the the moments where I produce, I believe, the best quality work on my like peace building and conflict transformation is when I'm also able to like channel uh, all the artistic stuff uh, somewhere. Uh, I, I really see both of them as complementing and it really helped me you know be more innovative uh, you know be more um efficient in 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 the management of my time uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh it can be balanced yeah so we are out of time and i want to know if give me some thumbs up if we need to wrap up now we understand bautista i don't know if you have uh, right now, uh, something else to jump to. Um, we are missing Amanda's question. So what what do I, I mean, this is it, the magic of facilitating virtual meetings is you can't read the room because there is there is no room, no room to read. But maybe you can respond in 15 seconds. Amanda's question was, in terms of people starting their careers, um, and she was talking about your peace building career, um, is it best to grow within the organization or just to start a position and then go get a master's and then come back in, in terms of career 
personal growth of, of someone who's new in their careers. And then, uh, and then I just have to say, you know, it's a good webinar when your questions cannot be put because a lot of people um, were asking the questions and we all have to thank you about this stuff for that. So I let you answer and then thank you everyone. As you know, PCDN is here every Thursday at noon Eastern Standard, but whatever it is in Africa, Asia and Europe. Uh, we love you all and hope to see you soon. And here is Bautista's answer. And bye bye. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank Craig, thank Catalina, and thank everyone who's been uh, behind you know, the screen. Uh, we'll keep the dialogue uh, through all the networks, uh, but particularly through your network, which is fantastic. Amanda, to your question, I don't think there is one only way to go. I think. Um, you can uh, you can do it both ways. You can um, <clears throat> go do your masters and then and then jump into that first post or start uh, in the UN system, which is the one that I know better. It might be that uh, instead of uh, you know professional positions, just because uh, you would, you may not have a master's yet then you would have to go into the UN volunteers system where I think uh, you can apply for where you get paid as well uh, and you get to do very similar work than a, than a professional. It's just that it's a different modality. Um, what, so I think you can do it either way. Having, I mean, in my personal journey, I think looking back at it now, I think it is useful when you finish your undergrad, then you have some working experience and you don't have to think of going to uh, Central African Republic. You can be working with a community, you know, where you live and, uh, and gaining some like his skills, uh, you know, uh, for peace building and conflict transformation. So also think about that. What I would recommend uh, is that um, you, you, um, uh, undertake the um, uh, the, um, the, the, the you do a, a field you have a field experience at early stages in your career a good field experience just because when you grow a bit older then you will also want maybe to look at other aspects of your life and pay attention to them maybe not but maybe you do so to have that freedom and I go back to this concept of freedom uh, uh, then it might be better to do that at, at early stages in your career. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we're going to wrap up here, but thank you so much, Baptista. It was wonderful. And I have a million questions, but we all have other things to do. Um, actually, one super simple question, actually 10 second answers, two questions. What skills do you recommend people pursue to keep their career vital and happy? And then what's happening with your acting career? Any you know, like I put in the link, but you've got a few things on Netflix, but like what, what's coming up next? Uh, so in terms of skills, uh, I have like one, two, three, four actionable things that I, uh, tips of advice could work. Specialize and gain years of experience on a specific field that you would also give you, that it would also give you flexibility to engage in new challenges, right? Identify rosters to which you can apply. So uh, many agencies within the UN system have rosters, particularly in the peace building, conflict transformation, uh, but there are others. So identify the rosters and, you know, apply for them and, and try to become a member in those rosters. And there are other entities outside the UN who do, who do that. Interpeace is one of them. They have a fantastic uh, roster as well, of peace building professionals. Work on consolidating your network, getting your profile to be known, public, public publishing, active engagement in different networks and activities, etc. Uh, and pay attention to the substance, but also to the processes, systems, methodologies, and culture proper to each uh, organization that you might be interested in joining. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. And then uh, in terms of my acting career, uh, so uh, basically at the moment, I'm actually, <laughs> at some point tonight, I will have to write a proposal to try to bring um, uh, a Spanish play, the Spanish play that uh, I had the, the chance to, to play uh, in, 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 in 
in Spain in 2017 to bring it here with support from uh, internet from the international cooperation. Uh, that's also where like both worlds uh, collide in a good way, uh, and it is really. Uh, touching piece uh, written, uh, which won uh, an award in the US that speaks about uh, uh, a dignified death uh, of, of a woman who, who is uh, terminally ill and, uh, and how we learn to, to deal with that, even from like the highest love uh, that you can have. So uh, that will hopefully come up uh, at some point this year in the format that it could come up, which is it will be limited or conditioned to, by the, the pandemic situation. So thank you so much. Um, we shared Sir Batista's LinkedIn, so feel free to connect. Um, come back next week tomorrow. The podcast is with a brilliant water scholar who's looking at water scarcity around the world, um, works for a multilateral institution. So we haven't had that so far, so it'll be out tomorrow. And thank you again, Batista. We hope you get the proposal. We hope we see a lot, even more peace building impact and that you have a Netflix series starting soon. But thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Craig. Thank you.